Hello and welcome back to High School History and here is the much awaited chapter on colonial cities from Themes in Indian History part 3. If you've been watching my videos so far and you found them useful and you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, I urge you to do that and also switch on the notification icon so that next time I post uh, a curriculum related or study methods related video, you are the first to know. So now that it's out of our way, let's get started with the chapter. So in this chapter, we're going to be studying about the three big cities of the colonial period, that is Madras, Calcutta and Bombay. Originally, all three were fishing or weaving villages, but they became important centers of trade due to the economic activities of the English East India Company. Now, uh, Madras came to be settled in 1639, Calcutta in 1690. And Bombay was given to the EEIC in 1661 by the English king who had received Bombay uh, as part of um, his wife's dowry from the king of Portugal. The company established its trading and administrative offices in each of these settlements. But before we go into studying these three presidency towns, let's look at what towns and cities were like before the British East India Company was in India. So what was the basic characteristic? Uh, when we look at pre-colonial cities, we uh, generally see them as centers of economic activity or culture. They could be capital cities or they could be temple towns or they could be uh, weaving centers and such like. But most cities dominated over the rural population uh, in terms of the fact that they extracted the surplus uh, from um, the rural areas in the form of taxes. Towns and cities were often fortified, which also symbolized a separation between the urban and the rural sector. But this separation was fairly fluid at this time because peasants would travel long distances on pilgrimage, especially they went to pilgrimage towns. Uh, they would pass through other towns. They also flocked to towns during times of famine or other distress. Then there was also a reverse flow of humans, especially when there were large-scale invasions. Uh, the city dwellers would kind of escape into the villages uh, and try to seek sheltered there. Traders and peddlers would take goods from the towns to sell in the villages also, therefore extending markets and creating new patterns of consumption. Often you're given the impression that these villages were self-sufficient units which had nothing to do with the city apart from paying taxes, but that's not actually true. So during the 16th and 17th centuries, Mughal towns were famous for their concentration of population. Some of these cities were even larger than the largest cities of Europe of the times. They had monumental buildings, which we still see today, and their imperial grandeur and wealth could leave anyone awestruck. Agra, Delhi and Lahore were the three preeminent cities in pre-colonial India. Uh, they were in turns, you know, uh, capital cities of the Mughals at different times. Mansabdars and Jagirdars who had been given territorial uh, assignments, they also set up their cities on the lines of these royal cities as well. The presence of the emperor and noblemen in these centers also meant that they needed a lot of services and which in turn generated a lot of employment. So you would have a large number of artisans who produced exclusive handicrafts for the household of the nobles. Grain from the countryside was being brought into urban markets for the town dwellers and the army. The treasury would also be located in the imperial capital and therefore the revenue from the entire empire would flow into the capital regularly. Emperor himself would live in a fortified palace. So you have the Lahore, the Delhi and the um, Agra forts um, that we still see today. Uh, and entry and exit to these cities was regulated by different gates. So if you're a Delhiite, you know that there are multiple gates to the Red Fort. Um, there is a Delhi Darwaza, there is a Lahori gate from where you actually enter um, the fort premises today. Uh, there's also a Kashmiri gate and so on. Within these towns were gardens, mosques, temples, tombs, colleges, bazaars and caravanserais and the focus of the town was largely oriented towards the palace and the principal mosque. So when you look at the city of Shah Jahanabad located in present day Delhi, uh, you have of course Red Fort, you have the Jama Masjid and you have the entire part of Shah Jahanabad actually focused towards these two focal points. 
in the towns of south india such as madurai and kanchipuram the principal focus was the temple because they they were primarily temple towns but don't uh, be mistaken because these temple towns were also centers uh, of um, commerce and uh, handicrafts especially madurai and kanchipuram are known for their silks and cotton weaving religious functions and festivals often coincided with fairs which linked pilgrimage with trade and generally the ruler was the highest authority and the principal patron of religious institutions um medieval towns were also places where everyone was expected to know their position in the social order that also determined where you lived in the city so in north india it was the job of the kotwal uh, who would oversee these internal affairs and make sure everyone respected their place in society and lived accordingly but by the 18th century a lot of changes were happening we know that the mogal empire was in rapid decline by now which uh, led to the shift of power from the three preeminent cities of delhi agra and lahore to more regional centers so um regional powers were growing now as we mentioned earlier and now you had cities like lucknow hyderabad srirangapatnam pune nagpur baroda and tanjore Uh, which became preeminent cities so not only known for their crafts or commerce but also become important centers of administration and many of those who were associated with the mogal court earlier were now beginning to migrate towards these regional cities in search of better opportunities there were also some new urban settlements which were coming up called the kasba and the ganj they were generally localized market townships so again i'm using the uh, example of delhi um and we have places like pahad ganj or darya ganj uh, so these even today uh, are market centers however the effects of political decentralization and emergence of cities was quite uneven in some places there was renewed economic activity in other places war plunder and political uncertainty had led to a general decline there were also changes in the network of trade which was reflected in the history of urban centers uh so for example the portuguese uh, had set up their uh, base in panji uh the dutch had set up in masuli patnam the british in madras and the french in pondicherry and as the commercial uh, activities around these towns were growing um, as the land based empires of asia was rapidly being replaced by the powerful sea based european empires cities underwent a further change forces of international trade mercantilism and capitalism would now define the nature of society as well which we shall discuss uh, later from the mid 18th century there was also a new phase of change so there were newer commercial centers which were emerging at this point of time so you had surat masuli patnam which we have already mentioned and also dhaka so from the mid 18th century there was a new phase of change centers such as surat masuli patnam and dhaka which had grown in importance in the 17th century began to decline again because there were some replacement cities uh, coming up in their vicinity which took away their commercial business so as the british gradually acquired political control after the battle of plassey in 1757 the trade of the english east india company expanded and colonial port cities such as madras calcutta and bombay now emerged as the new economic capitals and rapidly they also became centers of colonial administration and political power and so new buildings and institutions were now developed urban spaces were ordered and reordered but all to satisfy the needs of these european trading companies now the question is how do we find out about these colonial cities what kind of information do we have and what can we make of this information so the british kept detailed records of their trading activities in order to regulate the commercial affairs so we've got a lot of those that are available to us to keep track of life in growing cities they carried out regular surveys and gathered statistical data and published various official reports some of these were maps uh topographical maps would help them understand the landscape and how they could build and control the area better um when towns began to grow maps were prepared not only to plan the development of these towns but also to develop commerce and consolidate power the town maps also gave information regarding location of hills rivers and vegetation all of which would be very important for planning structures for defense purposes they also show the location of ghats density and quality of houses and alignment of roads which would help them understand commercial possibilities and plan strategies of trans, uh, taxation from the late 19th century the british tried to raise money for administering the towns because they obviously did not want to spend their own money doing that and this they managed to do through the systematic annual collection of municipal taxes now to avoid conflict they handed over some of the responsibilities of uh this local organization 
by establishing municipal corporations and gave some of the power to the Indian representatives. Now remember, uh, voting rights were uh, very, very limited, but even then it did mean that some of the decisions, localized decisions, were being taken by elected Indians. And these municipal corporations were generating a whole new set of uh, information and data which were maintained in municipal record rooms. Growth of cities was also monitored through headcount or census taking. So the first All India census was attempted in 1872 and from 1881 onwards, every 10 years, they began to conduct censuses. Uh, and this becomes an invaluable source for us also to study urbanization in India. Now, historians have found that these figures that the census uh, collectors, the census officials collected, they could be, you know, a mixed bag. They could be very, very misleading. So before we use these figures, we need to understand who collected the data and why and how they were gathered. We also need to know what was measured and what was not measured. The census operation, for example, was a means by which social data was converted into convenient statistics about the population. But there were lots of ambiguities. So census commissioners divide categories for classifying different sections of the population, but this classification was often um, arbitrary and they didn't really understand the fluid and overlapping identities of the Indian people. For example, how was a person who was both an artisan and a trader to be classified? How was a person who cultivated his land and then took those crops to the city to be um, uh, sold? How was he to be categorized? So would we call him a cultivator or a grain trader? Often people themselves also refused to cooperate and gave evasive answers to the census officials. And for a long while, Indians were very, very suspicious of these census operations. Why? Because they thought that, you know, they were the British were trying to impose new taxes. So, you know, let's fudge some of the data so that they don't give, um, ask us for more taxes. Uh, for the upper caste people or those families which maintained parda and segregation of women, uh, they were not happy about giving away data to some official about their about the women in their homes that was supposed to be private knowledge. Census officials also found that people were claiming identities that the people thought had a higher status. So, for example, there were hawkers who went to sell small articles during um, the seasons, while in other seasons they earned their livelihood through manual labor. So when they were interviewed, they would enumerate themselves as traders and not laborers. Similarly, figures of mortality and disease were also difficult to collect because all deaths were not registered and all illnesses were not reported. Most of the people uh, went to uh, you know the local um, Ayurvedic or Yunani doctor uh, to get treated and did not go to uh, licensed uh, medical professionals. Thus, historians have to use sources like the census with great caution to keep in mind uh, possible biases, recalculate figures, and sometimes try to look behind the figures and see what they really aren't telling us. From around the beginning of the 19th century, uh, we begin to see some trends of change. Uh, so even though the overall number of people living in cities doesn't really change much, it's only a rise, so from 1900 to 1940, it's only a rise of 3% from 10 to 13 but when we actually look behind this figure, we can see actually a lot of change taking place. For example, the earlier towns were now very rapidly in decline. So we talked about Surat which declined and in its place now Bombay comes up. Masuli Patnam declines due to the establishment of Madras. And once Calcutta comes up, uh, both Dhaka as well as Murshidabad, you know, go into decline. As the hub of the colonial economy, these new cities like Calcutta, Bombay and Madras became collection points for the export of Indian manufacture such as cotton textiles. And once uh, the industrial revolution is in place, this process gets reversed where the finished cotton goods first come here to be redistributed among within the country, within India. And then um, these are the ports from where Indian raw materials are going to be exported to Britain. Introduction of railways also played a big role in these changes. Uh, 1853, first railway line is laid out and this means a death knell for Surat completely. Uh, so economic activity now gradually is shifting away from traditional towns. Uh, every railway station becomes a collection depot for raw materials and a distribution point for imported goods. So we have examples like Mirzapur on the Ganga which specialized in collecting cotton and cotton goods from the Deccan but this declined when a railway link was made to Bombay. With the expansion of the railway network, railway workshops and railway colonies were established now. So railway towns like Jamalpur, Walter and Bareilly developed at this time. 
So what were these new towns like? How were they different from uh, the towns in the 16th and 17th centuries? So as we saw, Madras, Calcutta and Bombay are now these preeminent hubs of collection and distribution of goods. The English East India Company builds its factories, which actually are not manufacturing units, but they're only mercantile offices uh, or warehouses. And they also need to begin to fortify these settlements and these factories because there are other European companies too and there is a lot of competition and conflict among these different European trading companies. So in Madras, we have Fort St. George. In Calcutta, we have Fort William. And in Bombay, the fort marked the areas of British settlement. And they come to be known as the White Town. And all those Indians who had any interaction with the British uh, East India Company, they began to settle outside of the fort, which came to be known as the Black Town. So from the 19th century, the expanding network of railways linked these cities to the rest of the country. So as a result, the hinterland became more closely linked to these port cities, from where raw materials and labor were drawn. Since raw material was transported to these cities for export, there was also plentiful cheap labor available. Later on, these became convenient uh, areas to set up modern factories there because of, you know, how low the wages could be. After the 1850s, cotton mills were being set up by Indian merchants and entrepreneurs in Bombay, and European-owned jute mills were being established on the outskirts of Calcutta. And it was the cotton mills and the jute mills which marked the beginning of modern industrial development in India. There were only two proper industrial cities uh, in colonial India. One was Kanpur, which specialized in leather, woolen and cotton textiles. And the second was Jamshedpur, which specialized in steel. Obviously, the British had nothing to do with it. It was the Tata steel mills which were established there. So India never became a modern industrialized country because of the discriminatory colonial policies as well. So just to give you an example, banks would not give loans to Indians. If they did, the rates of interest were charged much higher than European industrialists. Um, if you wanted to transport your goods from point A to B, even your freight charges for Indian merchants was higher than those charged from European merchants. So naturally, industrialization was being, uh, Indian industrialists were being discouraged at every step. These new cities also led to a new kind of visual uh, situation here. First of all, there were many different kinds of service providers who began to flock to these cities. For example, interpreters, middlemen, traders and suppliers of goods. Economic activity near the river or the sea uh, leads to the development of docks and carts. And just along the shoreline were go-downs, mercantile offices, insurance agencies for shipping, transport depots and banking establishments. As you move further inland, they house the chief administrative offices of the company. For example, you have the writer's building in Calcutta, which was one such office. Around the periphery of the fort, the European merchants and agents built palatial houses in European style. Some built garden houses in the suburbs. And they also established racially exclusive clubs, race courses and theatres. The rich Indian agents and middlemen built large traditional courtyard houses in the black town, but the facade of those houses looked quite European. And to impress their English masters, they threw lavish parties during festivals. But on the other hand, they also built temples to establish their status in Indian society. The labouring poor provided a variety of services to their European and Indian masters as cooks, palanquin bearers, coachmen, guards, porters and construction and dock workers. After the revolt of 1857, the British attitudes towards India were shaped by a constant fear of rebellion. So they felt that the white town had to be defended better. So pasture lands and agrarian fields around the older towns were cleared and new urban spaces called civil lines were set up. And white people would live in these civil lines. Contonements were places where Indian troops under European command were stationed and they were also developed as safe enclaves. So even now when you have contonements in a number of cities in India, uh, they are occupied by armed forces personnel and they uh, are maintained as safe areas. For the British, the black areas came to symbolize not only chaos and anarchy, but also filth and disease. So initially, the British were interested primarily in the cleanliness and hygiene of the white areas. But as epidemics spread, they began to look at sewerage and water supply facilities in the black towns as well. They feared that disease would spread from the black to the white towns if they didn't do so. So from the 1860s and 70s, strict administrative measures were put into place regarding sanitation and building activity was regulated, underground pipe water and sewerage and drainage systems were also put in place. 
This is also a time when the first hill stations begin to come up. So what are these hill stations? They were mainly connected with the needs of the British Army. So uh, let's look at three preeminent uh, colonial hill stations. One was Shimla, which was founded during the course of the Gurkha War. The Anglo-Maratha War of 1818 uh, led to the development of Mount Abu and Darjeeling was wrested from the rulers of Sikkim in 1835. Hill stations were strategic from the point of view of uh, preventing an attack or actually launching an attack against your enemies. Uh, also, it was important because uh, they, the climate was more conducive and there were lesser diseases in this area. So these hill stations also became uh, to be known as sanitarium uh, sites where soldiers were sent to recover from injury or illness. Because the hill stations approximate the cold climates of Europe, they became an attractive destination for the new rulers. In fact, it became a practice for viceroys, starting from Viceroy John Lawrence, who had officially moved his council to Shimla, which marked the practice of shifting capitals from Delhi to Shimla in the hot season. In the hill stations, the British and other Europeans fought sought to recreate settlements that were reminiscent of home. The buildings that they built were deliberately built in their cottage style detached villas and gardens, the Anglican church and educational institutions represented British ideals, even recreational activities came to be shaped by British cultural traditions. So you would have social calls, teas, picnics, fates, races and visits to the theatre. The introduction of the railways made the hill stations more accessible, including to the Indians. So the upper and middle class Indians such as Maharajas, lawyers and merchants were drawn to these stations because they offered them uh, a close proximity to the ruling British elite. Hill stations are also important for the colonial economy. With the setting up of tea and coffee plantations, this saw an influx of migrant labor from the plains and this meant that the hill stations were no longer exclusive racial enclaves for the Europeans in India. What was social life like in these new cities? So there was a dramatic contrast between extreme wealth and, uh, and poverty on the other hand. New transport facilities meant that uh, people could actually live further away from home and travel every day uh, from home to work. Public parks and theatres were uh, added and then 20th century saw the advent of the cinema halls. This provided new forms of entertainment and social interaction. Within the cities, new social groups were also formed and the old identities uh, of people were no longer important. So all classes of people were migrating to the big cities. There was an increasing demand for clerks, teachers, lawyers, doctors, engineers and accountants. As a result, the middle class section began to increase. The middle classes also had access to new educational institutions such as schools, colleges and libraries. And as educated people, they could put forward their opinions on society and government in newspapers, journals and public meetings. Many of these newspapers and journals were actually started by Indians themselves. Social change did not happen with ease. Middle class women sought to express themselves through the medium of journals, autobiographies and books, but it was difficult for them to do so because conservatives feared that the education of women, women would turn the world upside down and threaten the basis of the entire social order. Even reformers who supported women's education saw women primarily as mothers and wives and wanted them to remain within the enclosed spaces of the household. Over time, women became more visible in public as they entered new professions in the city as domestic and factory workers, teachers and actresses in theatre and film. But for a long time, women who moved out of the household into public spaces remained objects of social censure. They were uh, disrespected um, and ridiculed and so on. Another new class within the cities was the labouring poor or the working class. Paupers from rural areas, those who had lost their lands, came to the city in hope of employment. Some saw the city as places of opportunity and others were attracted by a different way of life that they had never seen before. To minimize the cost of living in the city, most male migrants left their families behind in their village homes. Life in the city was a struggle, yet the poor often created a lively urban culture of their own. They were enthusiastic participants in religious festivals and tamashas and swangs which, were often, which often mocked the pretensions of their masters, both Indian and European. Now let us come to the case studies of Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. Starting with Madras, Madras represented the segregation of uh, the British and the Indian. Even though we are not talking about segregation in Calcutta and Bombay right now, uh, what we will see in Madras kind of got replicated in Bombay and Calcutta also. So in 1639, East India Company established a trading post in Madrasapatam 
this settlement was locally known as chenna patnam which is why when they changed the name of madras they named it to chennai the company had purchased the right of settlement from the local telugu lords the nayaks of kalahasti who were eager to support trading activity in the region but because of a long standing rivalry with the french east india company the british needed to fortify madras and thus came up fort st george once the french are defeated in 1761 madras becomes more secure and begins to grow into an important commercial town it was here that the superiority of the british and the subordinate position of the indian merchants was most apparent so we see the fort of uh, the fort st george becoming a nucleus of the white town where most of the europeans lived walls and bastions made it a distinct enclave color and religion determined who was allowed to live in the fort the dutch and the portuguese were allowed to stay here because they were european and christian and they were not uh, serious uh, competitors of the british east india company the administrative and judicial systems also favored the white christian settlers here the black town developed outside the fort it was laid out in straight lines uh, it was however demolished in mid 1700s and the area was cleared for a security zone around the fort and a new black town was developed further to the north this housed weavers artisans middlemen and interpreters who played a vital role in the company trade the new black town resembled the indian traditional towns with living quarters built around its own temple and bazaar there were distinct caste specific neighborhoods uh, chintradi pet for example was meant for weavers washerman pet was a colony of dyers and bleachers of cloth royapuram was a settlement for christian boatmen who worked for the company several different communities came and settled in madras and they performed a range of economic functions there were dubashes who were indians uh, speaking two languages they worked as agents and merchants acting as intermediaries between indian society and the british and they used their privileged possession uh, position in government to acquire wealth their powerful position in society was established by their charitable works and patronage of temples in the black town initially jobs with the company were monopolized by the velalars who were a rural caste but with the spread of english education in the 19th century brahmins also began to compete for similar positions in administration telugu komatis were powerful commercial group that controlled the grain trade in the city uh, gujarati bankers had also been present since the 18th century in this region pariyars and vaniyars formed the laboring poor the nabab of arcot settled in nearby triplicane became the nucleus of a substantial muslim settlement Then you had Mylapore and Triplicane, which were earlier Hindu religious centers that supported a large group of Brahmins. Santhom, with its cap- cathedral, was the center of Roman Catholics. All these settlements became part of the Madras city. Thus, the incorporation of many villages made Madras a city of a wide expanse and low density. So, as the British consolidated their power, resident Europeans began to move out of the fort. Garden houses first started coming up along the two main arteries, that is, Mount Road and Poonamalli Road. leading from the fort to the cantonment well the indians also started to live like the english as a result many new suburbs were created from existing villages around the core of madras this was possible because the wealthy could afford transport they had their own personal transport the poor would settle in villages that were closer to their place of work but the gradual urbanization of madras meant that the areas between these villages were now becoming urbanized so as a result madras would really have a semi rural air about it quite unlike what we see in bombay and calcutta we now move to calcutta to see how town planning was undertaken but again just to remind you that just because we talk about town planning in calcutta did not mean there was an absence of town planning in bombay and madras this is just a case study So modern planning was usually inspired by a vision of what the city should look like. So the ideology of development was that this vision would reflect the presumed exercise of state power over urban lives and urban spaces. So firstly, why did the British undertake town planning in India? So in 1756 Siraj ud Daulah had attacked Calcutta and he had defeated the British uh, army posted there. So therefore when Calcutta was being replanned, the first thing that they kept in mind was that defense had to be full proof so calcutta had grown from three villages called shuta nuti kolkata and govindpur the company cleared a site in the southernmost village of govindpur and the traders and weaving weavers living there were asked to move out and the new fort william was uh, constructed here and just outside of the fort william they would leave a vast open space which came to be known as moidan or gorel mart and this would offer a kind of a security vista for the fort 
In 1798, Lord Wellesley became the Governor General and he built a massive palace called the Government House for himself in Calcutta. Today, it houses the Governor of West Bengal. The crowding, the excessive vegetation, the dirty tanks, smells and poor drainage in the Indian part of the towns here worried the British because they believed at the time that poisonous gases from the marshlands and pools of stagnant water was the cause of most diseases, including malaria. So you see, when they named this disease, they also called it malaria coming from mal or bad air. Today, of course, we know that malaria is caused by the female Anopheles mosquito. The tropical climate itself was seen as unhealthy. Many bazaars, ghats, burial grounds, tanneries were cleared or removed. And from then on, the notion of public health actually becomes an idea um, that uh, the government, that it is the responsibility of the government to look after public health. The threat of epidemics also gave further impetus to town planning in the next few decades. Cholera had begun to spread from 1817 and then 1896, uh, plague uh, made its appearance. Uh, and because medical science had not yet established the causes of these diseases, the accepted theory was that there was a direct correlation between living conditions and spread of disease. Such views were also supported by prominent Indian merchants in the city such as Dwarka Tagore and Rustam Kavaschi, who felt that Calcutta needed to be made more healthy. Frequent fires in Calcutta also led to stricter building regulations. For example, the thatched roof was now banned and you only had to use the terracotta tiles for your roofing. The existing racial divide of the white town and black town was reinforced by the new divide of healthy and unhealthy. Indian representatives in the municipality protested against this unfair bias towards the development of European parts of the town and this in turn strengthened the anti-British feeling and encouraged nationalism. So the work of town planning was carried out by the Lottery Committee. So what was this Lottery Committee? So this was set up in 1817 with the help of the government. The lottery committee was so named because funds for town improvement would now be raised through public lotteries. The lottery committee commissioned a new map of the city so as to get a comprehensive picture of Calcutta. Among the committee's major activities were road building in the Indian part of the city and clearing the river bank of encroachment. In its drive to make Calcutta, in its drive to make the Indian parts of Calcutta cleaner, the committee removed many huts and displaced the labouring poor who were now pushed to the outskirts of Calcutta. We now come to Bombay and in Bombay we are going to discuss architecture. Again to repeat, Madras and Kolkata also had their fair share of colonial architecture. So one of the most powerful ways of expressing the imperial vision is through creating monumental buildings. So buildings in cities would include forts, government offices, educational institutions, religious structures, commemorative towers, commercial depots or even docks and bridges. Although primarily serving functional needs such as defense, administration and commerce, they were rarely simple structures. They were often meant to represent ideas such as imperial power, nationalism or religious glory. So when we look at Bombay, it, originally it was a set of seven islands and as the population grew, the islands were joined to create more space and they gradually fused into one big city. Bombay was the commercial capital of colonial India and as a premier port on the western coast, it was the center of international trade as well. By the end of the 19th century, half the imports and exports of India were passing through Bombay. One important item of this trade was opium that the East India Company was exporting to China. Indian merchants and middlemen actually uh, supplied and participated in this trade and they helped integrate Bombay's economy directly to Malwa, Rajasthan and Sindh where opium was being grown. This collaboration with the company was profitable and led to the growth of an Indian capitalist class. And later on, it was this Indian capitalist class which would really fuel the industrialization of the country. In 1869, the Suez Canal was opened and this further strengthens Bombay's position and links with the uh, world economy. And the um, Bombay government actually declares Bombay the herbs prima in Indus, which is a Latin phrase meaning that the, it was the most important city of India. By the late 19th century, Indian merchants in Bombay were investing their wealth in new ventures such as cotton mills and they also patronized building activity within Bombay also. So as Bombay's economy grew from the mid-19th century, there was a need to expand railways and shipping and develop administrative structure and the buildings reflected this culture of confidence of the rulers. The architectural style was obviously European. This importation of European styles reflected the imperial vision in several ways. Firstly, it expressed the British desire 
to create family landscape in an alien country so that they could feel at home in the colony secondly the british felt that european styles would best symbolize their superiority authority and power over the indians and thirdly these buildings would actually mark the difference and distance between the colonial masters and their indian subjects now bungalow was an interesting structure which was indian style of building a house but we see that spread over large parts of india the name bungalow itself was derived from the word bangla or traditional thatched bengali hut the colonial bungalow was was set on extensive grounds which ensured privacy and marked a distance from the indian world around when you come to lutian's part of delhi you still see the remnants of these buildings and the structure remains the same that you have the house tucked further away from the road between the main gate of the house and the actual structure of the house there are these large gardens the traditional pitch roof and surrounding veranda kept the bungalow cool in the summer months the compound had separate quarters for a retinue of domestic servants so the bungalows in the civil lines actually became a rich exclusive area which was largely self sufficient three architectural styles were adopted by the british as they constructed their monumental architecture in india the first one was called the neoclassical it was largely based on the grandeur of imperial rome and it was just reprised from there so it char- it characterized geometrical structures fronted with lofty pillars one example of this was the town hall another group of commercial buildings built during the cotton boom of the 1860s was the elphinstown circle later named honiman circle after an english editor who courageously supported indian nationalists this building was inspired from models in italy it made innovative use of covered arcades at ground level to shield the shopper and pedestrian from the fierce sun and rain of bombay delhi's connaught place is largely built on this structure the second architectural style used by the british was neo gothic it was characterized by high pitched roofs pointed arches and detailed decoration uh, it has its roots in northern europe during the medieval period and the neo gothic or new gothic style was revived in the mid 19th century england So the secretariat the university of bombay and the bombay high court were all built in this style indians did give money for some of these buildings for example the university hall was made with money donated by sir kavasti jahangir reddy money uh, the university library clock tower was similarly funded by banker premchand raichand and this was named after his mother as rajabai tower indian merchants were happy to adopt the new gothic style since they believed that that building styles like many other ideas brought in by the english were progressive and would help make bombay into a modern city the most spectacular examples of the gothic style is the victoria terminus which was the headquarters of the great indian peninsula railway company the third architectural style used by uh, the british was the indo saracenic uh, which was actually um, the indo islamic style of architecture The inspiration for this style was medieval buildings in India with their domes, chhatris, jalis and arches by integrating Indian and European styles in public architecture. The British wanted to prove that they were legitimate rulers of India. So the gateway of India built in the traditional Gujarati style came to welcome King George V and Queen Mary to India in 1911 is a famous example. The industrial Jamshed ji Tata built the Taj Mahal hotel in a similar style. Now the chol was something very unique that grew in Uh, bombay uh, the, there was a lack of space in the city and overcrowding led to a type of building called a chol this was a multi storied single room apartment block with long open corridors built around a courtyard such buildings housed many families which shared common spaces and this also helped in the growth of a neighborhood identity and solidarity and in turn also supported the nationalist movement later on now what do buildings and architectural styles actually tell us so architecture reflects the aesthetic ideas which were prevalent at the time variations within those ideas as well buildings express the vision of the people who built them so rulers everywhere seek to express their power through buildings so by looking at the architecture of a particular time we can understand how power was conceived of and how it was expressed through structures and their attributes These styles would mold tastes, popularize styles and shape the contours of culture. Many Indians came to regard European styles of architecture as symbols of modernity and being civilized and began to adopt these styles as well. So from the late 19th century we see efforts to define regional and national tastes that were different from the colonial ideal as well. So styles therefore kept changing and developing through wider processes of cultural conflict. 
by looking at architecture therefore we can also understand the variety of forms in which cultural conflicts unfolded and political conflicts between the imperial national and the regional were played out so this brings us to the end of the lesson thank you very much if you have stayed till the end do not forget to like subscribe and switch on the bell icon till the next lesson it's goodbye now from high school history